All right, hi everybody, and welcome back to the Band with Kaleidoscope Ears. And once again, I'm with my good buddy James Corbett. Uh, good to see you, James. How are you doing tonight? Not too bad. How about yourself? Very well. Not bad. It's summertime here in LA. It's like above 80 degrees, so it's. Uh, I was going to say it's really cool, but it's actually really warm. So. And uh, yeah, so tonight we're doing this way. And from what you told me before we were having a little talk beforehand, you did some really extensive research on this song. and yeah. Unbelievable <laughs> amount of research. Do you want to hear all about this song? It took all of 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I went to BeatlesBible.com. Yeah, well, <laughs> There's yeah, a lot there of info on this well, song. Let's spare the reader that having to go, I mean, the viewer the, having to go through the trouble of going to the Beatles Bible, and maybe you could pull up some salient points about this particular piece of music. Sure. Well, okay, so we're talking about This Boy, which was released in 1963. Uh, sorry. Well, in the UK, released in November of 63, in US, January 64. But anyway, um, released as the B-side to I Want to Hold Your Hand. And John, in 1980, in All We Are Saying, said, Just my attempt at writing one of those three-part harmony Smokey Robinson songs. Nothing in the lyrics, just a sound and a harmony. There was a period when I thought I didn't write melodies, that Paul wrote those, and I just wrote straight shouting rock and roll. But of course, when I think of some of my own songs, in my life, or some of the early stuff, this boy, I was writing melody with the best of them. Um, which is probably true if he did write the melody to In My Life, which is somewhat disputed. But anyway... Uh, the song was oh, really? Yeah, there's some... Paul had some input. How much? Well, there's some dispute. Uh, the song was composed while the Beatles were on tour in 63. Uh, Paul McCartney told Barry Miles in many years from now, this boy was another hotel bedroom song. Twin beds one afternoon somewhere. We had arrived around one o'clock. We had a couple hours to kill, so we thought, let's write another... Let's write one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Rather like the hotel where the we hell? wrote... Uh, rather like the hotel where we wrote she loves you it's uh funny i remember the room and the position of the beds john and i sitting on twin beds the g plan furniture the british hotel with olive green and orange everywhere that marvelous combination the colors of vomit um <laughs> beatles bible goes on to say based on the circular chord sequences that were a staple of american doo-wop recordings this boy showcased the group's skill at singing in close harmony along with a blistering middle eight sung by lennon and Paul, again, telling Barry Miles, it was very co-written. We wanted to do a close harmony thing. We liked harmonies, and we were quite good at them. We used to do a close harmony version of the Teddy Bears, To Know Her Is To Love Her, which was good for the versatility in the band. We weren't all rock and roll. We could change the pace, which was always nice after you'd played for three hours. We wrote it in two-part harmony and then put the third part in for George to sing. We'd never actually tried to write something like that. Nice middle. John sang that great. Then we'd go back into the close harmony thing. It goes on from there. There's more details, but I think that's kind of the heart of it. Yeah, there was a famous sequence in Hard Day's Night where uh, Ringo is taking the lonely guy walk and he's kind of kicking cans and by the, you know. And uh, the story goes that Ringo felt he was being very unprofessional, but he had been out partying all night at a club, probably came off a real bender, didn't bother to go to sleep. He just came to the set and... Uh, <laughs> That's why he looks so despondent. <laughs> First of all, um, the intro, okay? Uh, we have John Lennon's famous D chord he does with the pinky. And I looked at uh, really one, Mike Pacelli is just awesome. I love his work. He did an analysis of this song. And basically, he just teaches you how to play John's part and George's part, right? But one thing I noticed, he was playing the, the standard John. Right? Well, I'm not hearing this high F sharp. So I analyzed it a little different than Mike, and I made a little discovery along the way. But the way I do it is I play a D in the order of F sharp D, F sharp A, D. All right, which is the first inversion of the chord. And I bar here. So it's just nice and easy to go. It's a bigger operation to, to use this four finger chord and go back and forth. Now here's the interesting thing. When I did this, F sharp, A, D, 
I thought that's a D sus two because we don't have the third, right? That country type of thing. Well, the discovery I made was Mike Pacelli, this is called a D, a D sus two over F sharp, meaning it's a D, well, not actually, no, not over F sharp. The sus, um, it's D over F sharp in the bass, and then uh, D sus two with the sus in the bass, all right? The, the E note, right? But here's the thing, this is D sus two, but he called it A sus four. And guess what? D sus two and A sus four are the same notes. They're the same chord. Yeah, it has exploding. Here's A. And if I think of A as the root and count up the scale, one, two, three, four, there's my suspension. So I get, right? If I think of this as D, and I put the suspended two in the bass, I get the same same three notes. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so A sus two and uh, D sus two and A sus four are the same chord. That was a little minor revelation for me. Uh, all right. So um, let's. So, uh, all right, now we're going to do, we're going to look at the chart for the song. And this is in, you could call it 6 8 or 12 8. I call it 12 8. I, to be strict about it, I'd say it's, even though I did 12 8 on the chart I wrote, I really feel it's more 6 8. Because the feel is more like 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, rather than 1, 2, 3, but it's kind of six of one half dozen of the other. And when you when you write charts, okay, from my own experience, it's a lot easier to write. It takes up a lot less space to write a 12 8 chart than a 6 8 chart because it's all you know added measures. It's double the amount of measures. So I did 12 8 out of my own for my own convenience. Okay, now I want to get right into this and. At the risk that the UMG Corporation is going to mute either this section or the entire podcast, we're going to take a chance and play nine seconds of the song because there's something very important that happens. And before we play that, I want to talk about it first and explain what's going on. I'm going to give you the spoiler now. Um, first of all, the, the melody... Uh, if, um, that note is the major seven of the D major chord. Now, what I'm going to say is, this is very related to the song Misty and a couple of other jazz tunes, where you'll see just a straight, like in jazz, they love to fatten up chords instead of, e, you know, E flat, they want E flat major nine or something like that, right? Well, the song Misty is a very major seven kind of song. Right? But when it does the turnaround, so if you hit that root note E flat and there's an E flat major seven, you're going to get a clash. And it'll sound like this, right? Not pleasant. Well, in a D chord, if you sing the major seven, ah, right? So here's what happened. It blew my mind when and nobody, I don't think anybody else in the world has discussed this about the song. Uh, And the Hell's Angels don't want you to discuss it either. <laughs> yeah, God knows what that was. It sounded like a 747 just <laughs> right through the alley. Um, if you listen very closely, okay, you hear the guitar intro first, right? So you get... And then the vocal comes in, right? You will hear George Martin or Norman Smith, whoever was at the, the engineering board, that was at the, at the board, 
lower the fader so you don't hear the guitar for a moment. And then when the next chord comes in, the fader comes up. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if it's because of the clash with the major seven. So if it's true, it would have happened on every verse. And any time they sang the major seven sound against the D. Well, I checked the rest of the song. Sure enough, it drops out just at those moments. So that was George Martin knowing that there was going to be a clash with the major seven note. And he dropped it out. You know, so what I'd like to do is let's play the first 10 seconds of the song. And you could hear as soon as the vocal comes in, this first chord of the guitar drops out and then it comes in a moment later. So let's give that a listen. Right? Yeah. And that happens in every uh, every verse, you know. Huh. Um, yeah. I never heard that before. Yeah. Now, one thing that Mike Pacelli brought up regarding the chord playing, he said it's an old rock trick. I, I, I don't know. But, like, basically when you have 12-8 or 6-8, um, you have, like, the count is, like, 1, 2, 3, 2, 2, 3, 3, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3. So it counts like a 4, 4, 3, 4. So John, according to Mike, is playing one, two, three, four. So it's like one, two, three, four. And George is the guy that's going. So that's, uh, you know, the, the two guitar parts. I don't usually get into that stuff, you know, like who's playing what, but um, it's nice to hear. And another note is when we come into the, the bridge. Um, uh, that section, John is playing a D7. And I think Mike said it was this one. And George is playing a D9. So I'm, I'm always interested in this stuff because they were so young to think of these things, you know, like this thing. I don't think any guitar player of that era that came up from from nothing, you know, I'm talking not the session guys, but the rock and rollers who were coming up did that move. And John was like 19 years old, maybe 20. So that, you know. Fact check, in 63, he would have been 23. Come on. Oh, is that right? Because I, I, yeah, I looked it up, I, I, and uh, yeah, I probably blew that. That's fine. You know you know how bad I am yeah, with history, but which is I, really ironic. I know what the comments will be like, but <laughs> yeah, right. as if, as if <laughs> that makes a difference to your point. <laughs> Fact check. <laughs> so um, I think uh, I want to talk a little bit about this kind of rhythm um because when we look at the chart you're going to see things like a dotted quarter note and a dotted rest and i want to explain what these dots are about what their deal is so um all right so what we have here these are the figures in a 12 8 notice these are eighth notes so that's where the eight comes from and for each beat, you get one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay. So that's equivalent to a quarter note, which is two eighths, right? Plus one more eighth right there. So they came up with this artifice called the dot. And the dot is half the value of the note added to the note itself. So half of a quarter is an eighth. So a dotted quarter takes up the space of these three notes. So if you wanted something to stretch out for that beat, one, two, three, 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 that would be a dotted quarter note. So we're going to see that. The equivalent space of time that's in silence would be a dotted quarter rest, which will also be available in the chart. Okay, so James, uh, I've got the chart right here. And what I'd like to do is maybe play the um, All You Need Is Love guy. And uh, he does a beautiful vocal job on this. And we're going to just follow the chart as it goes.
Okay. So that's that. Now, let me talk um, just shortly about all this stuff. I said, uh, let's see, here's our, here's our example of a dotted quarter rest, because it should be counting one, two, three, four. Right? It's vague, but that would be the logical explanation of what's going on there. Uh, so that, that will be the extent of our intro. We go once one round through the chords, which is the Beatles being very sensitive to the pop sensibility. Okay, we, we don't have to go around this chord progression twice before the vocal comes in. Let's just do it once real quick so we get into the meat and potatoes right away. Uh, so here's our 12A. Again, like these cuts would be one, uh, sorry, one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, right? So that's why we have the dotted quarter, uh, dotted quarter rest, dotted quarter, dotted quarter rest, blah, blah, blah. And that goes on like that. This is a mistake. I think that I, I think it should be a double dotted whole note. I forget how that all works, but I didn't want to bother thinking about it because I'm just that lazy. So, all right, so we could get into further stuff with this now. Just wanted to lead us through that. All right, did would I, as we went through that, did all the directions make sense? Like where to jump and? I think oh, so. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Oh, just a side note here. You know, uh, I got the recent snooty comment. Uh, oh, he's so pretentious, you know, talking about all this music theory stuff, you know. And it's funny because when I landed on the Wikipedia page, it said uh, from one music theorist, he said, what's particularly interesting about this song is the pandiatonic clusters. <laughs> I'm like, I sound pretentious. <laughs> I'm even wondering, like, pandiatonic, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, you know, I decided to, even though I know what pandiatonicism is, I decided to look it up anyway on Wikipedia. And it's a little, it's slightly short of the mark. It's basically saying if you're in a key and you have a chord, you could stick any note from that key onto the chord and it's, it's allowed. Uh, you know, but that that's like a classical approach, like a jazz guy wouldn't think of a ninth chord as a pan diatonic cluster. It's just an extended seventh chord, you know. So uh, talk about pretentious. There we go. All right. So I talked about the, uh, another, like, another situation where that, by the way, where this, that clash with the major seven is the Christmas song by Mel Torme. Because you have two roots. So... Uh, now that's a that's a song that you would think is very major seventh-y, right? Right? But when you sing it's there's all this all this stuff going on. So it's it's written as a triad or a major sixth chord. Very often what they do when that clash happens is they'll they'll write in a major six because jazzers don't from that era don't like triads. All right. They like the fluffy extended chords. Not so true for modern musicians, um, modern jazz guys. Like triads matter; they count, you know. Um, all right. So I would say, first of all, we have a doo-wop progression here. All right, from the fifties, one, six, two, five, where he's playing an E minor seven, which is nice. It acts almost like a suspension would on the A. Of suspension on the A. But it's much fuller and richer. All right, so um, as far as that goes, like um, the Beatles were, I mean, I, I know there were reference to particular songs that they were kind of influenced by, but the fact of the matter is they were imbued with this 50s chord progression. It was the equivalent then of today, the one, five, six, four, it was just all over the place. I don't know why they didn't get bored with it, like why it lasted for so long, but it did. Uh, and in fact, I, you know, I was almost going to like do a video of me actually singing a song I wrote uh, called Temporary Emotion because my generation, 
Generation Jones, by the way. It's a new term for it, from what, from what I heard. Uh, we weren't the hippies. So we, uh, I, one of my theories is that the, the punkers and the new wave guys were drawing back to pre-Beatles rock and roll because the sophistication of, of rock and roll just got to be too much and they wanted to get back to the immediate message that rock and roll could provide. Uh, so Elvis Costello, I noticed, he was the first guy that really got like, oh, I understand what's going on here. A lot of his music hailed back to that old pop music. Yeah, I came up with this kind of like in response to a song like This Boy. And uh, I'm putting a capo here because I actually am going to like sing the melody a little bit. But um, say, uh, say, say, yeah. So yeah, I, that, this is this is a rare moment of me singing. I never ever ever sing, but uh, you know, I just wanted to bring up this idea that we were drawing on yeah. on on early. Can I ask about that music. progression? Because I definitely hear the one six two, but then it's not five. Right? Oh yeah, no, that's why I wanted a surprise. I wanted mm. to make sure that it'd be different from like it would evoke the fifties, but not be the fifties. Right. Yeah, you know, that's cool. Actually. So. And it's all chord family template. It's all in the same key. Mostly, there's one, one uh, four minor, but that's about it. But that's uh, this is one six, two, four, three, six, two, uh, four, which I think is was a nice change up, you know, from the yeah. I got like, I, I it got definitely help. evokes, and you think you're going doo wop, but then it doesn't do that so that's cool it doesn't go there yeah. and i i kind of thought that's what elvis would elvis costello might have done if he tried to cop yeah. that yeah you know something similar to that i got hell from my peers about the lyrics they were just they just thought they were awful lyrics and yeah that's true i was young i so what <laughs> john and paul so, were in their uh, 20s yeah. Or early 20s. Yeah, yeah right. Come know. on, you can't use young as we an all, excuse. All can, yeah. Anyway, let me just put yeah, this right out there as a, uh, as a research project for budding musicologists. What was it about 1625 that spoke to the teenage soul in the 1950s? And what is it about 1564 that speaks to the teenage soul in the 2000s? Right. And uh, in case you're not aware of it, this is a 1564. And you can name a thousand songs right off the cuff that do that. So just so you know, that's the one five six four. It's maddening. Uh, I did this. I did this thing one day, where I took one five six and four, and I decided to start on five and go around the treadmill, or start on six and go around the, around the treadmill. And that was even more interesting, you know, just something different than that. I I can't tell you how pervasive <laughs> that chord per per first song i ever wrote was 6154 so in my defense it was slightly different <laughs> six one yeah well that's not bad though that and as long as there's a change up that's why i like the buffy the vampire uh slayer song the theme song for that because 
it, you thought it was going to do that, but then there's that one change of chord. I'm like, thank God, I love this song. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway <laughs> let's look at the bridge. <laughs> All right, so we have the, you know. Now, this is, uh, I, I I really like what's happening with the chords here. Um, this, this, boy, this boy would be happy just to love you. But oh my, that boy won't be happy till he sees you. I mean, just right off the bat, the vocal is so great in this. John is really a feel in it. It's just so good. And that was, you know, he was he was kind of like that 50s, like a lot of that 50s emotional romantic music was really histrionic. It was really overly emotional at times, Yeah, you know. But he but sold John, it, and it was great. Sincerity. You know what I like about that is the contrast between the uh, uh, the harmonies in the background while he's screaming his heart out in the front. Front. It's, oh yeah, it really yeah. works well together. Yeah. Oh yeah, Beatles magic all the way through this song. I really feel it, you know. Um, but let me let me tell you. Let, let's talk about the imagination behind. All right, he has this melody, and he's finding the chords for it. Right. So this this boy. Now, would be happy just to love you, <laughs> but oh my, that boy won't be happy, right? So there's all this color in his use of secondary dominant chords rather than the chords from the key itself. So, and that's, this is so nice because this is, Strictly harmonic minor uh, movement. If I'm thinking we're going, that's for the momentary root is right there on the B minor chord. Well, the B harmonic minor chord family template would have a G major, an F sharp seven, and a B minor, right? <laughs> and then we have the the D seven. It comes in again. It comes in the first time uh, to to ring in the G chord. That, that D7 is 5-7 of the G chord, or 5-7 of 4. So, um... And you can really, it really does build. Uh, and by the way, Mike Pacelli noted something about this bridge, which is it, really cool um, in the guitars. Because remember we cited earlier, John is doing... When we get to the D7, and the rest of the way he's playing through, and you could hear like that. That's like rolling thunder, man. That that is really strong the way it's coming in, and very dramatic, you know. So it builds the song up, as opposed to he could have easily this boy would be happy with an A chord, right? But that F sharp seven is so potent. This boy would be happy. And by the way, it's the same exact melody. Those are two notes of an A major chord. He could have done that. He did that. And then, okay, so the D seven comes back to bring us back to that G. And I've seen the Beatles do this before in songs, this 5-7 of 5, E7. I've seen them do this before in their early days where they'll have one change up, like this does the F sharp 7, and the next time around they'll replace that with this chord, which is the 5-7 of 5, two dominant 7, uh, resolving to A7. So... Um,
Beautiful. Stupid question. What note is he singing there on the cry? I think it's the third of the chord. No. Oh, it's the sixth of the chord. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Interesting note to hit on the five chord. Um, and the Beatles did a lot of that kind of thing where they'd hit the sixth in the melody line. So is it just you an know, implied and that is the sixth. seventh there? Five, seven leading back to the, the original? Yeah, group? absolutely. Yeah. 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 I think it's he's playing a strictly A major chord, but it could have easily been A7. It, it works either way. Um, but, you know, the, the weird thing is he's hitting also a suspension. There's another problem there. This uh, wouldn't But for some reason, it rolls through okay. Not as it's not as bad as the major seven for some reason. But I, I'm I'm curious to listen to it again and see if George Martin is pulling down the faders on that too. You know, who knows? Um. All right, so uh, that's a you know that that bridge is is really nice. It's it's really lovely, um, well written, very much in the style. Uh, very emotional and dramatic, but not overly so. It's so sincere that it works. The only thing that takes me out of it is that, you know, super big climax and the big note, and then the savage edit <laughs> to go back to the verse. It, you can hear the edit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can hear the edit. Yeah, Which, yeah, I appreciate yeah. the uh, All You Need Is Love cover. <laughs> he, he preserves that edit. He could have done it much smoother than that, but he <laughs> puts it in, like, deliberately. <laughs> And Beatles replicators are meticulous about mm. doing things exactly the way they did them. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, the, the analogs, I think what, the analogs, if you're a Beatles fan and you watch the analogs do I Am The Walrus, it is mind-blowing to watch this because they've managed to get all the effects in that crazy, crazy song, you know. So on the anthology, so. they have a live version of this, um, which obviously they can't do the edit live. So uh, obviously John just sits out the first the first note or two of the uh, the next of the verse coming back from the bridge you know i have to be honest with you i'm kind of, i was kind of faking it because i i'm not quite sure where that i don't i never noticed that uh edit before to be really? honest with you it's so obvious yeah all right hold on uh, let's listen yeah, to I'm all you sure need is love I can unhear it once I... um let's just find it here hold on Oh, <laughs> wow, it's he actually absolute, did it, the cut. Yeah, it's exactly like just, like you can tell in the old days when they used to have to rip the tape and piece it together or whatever. You know, and I bet back in those days, that would have been a high five moment too. Like, yeah, wow. Exactly. Hey, that works. You know, we, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, every time I've ever heard this song, I hear that edit so clearly. Wow. Yeah, no, I will never be able to unhear that now, now that I've heard it. Yeah. Wow. I can't believe I noticed. I didn't notice that. But to be honest with you, I wasn't, I didn't go really deep into the listening uh, of the song. So uh, that's my excuse. All right, so we also, I'm going to recommend um, for people who are interested in the vocals, because I didn't really pick them apart, um, who does a great job as a channel called um, The Beatles Vocals, I think. And uh, there's this guy, Galeazzo Frudua. Galeazzo Frudua uh, does a beautiful breakdown of the song, and he shows you like what part George is singing, what part. It's really wonderful. And he has a, like, I liked what he had to say. So let's just play that little clip of uh, Galeazzo talking about this song for a moment. This boy is a ballad by John Lennon. It's, you know, it's pretty simple to sing. There are three boys going parallel, one over each other. In this boy, Paul and John do some very elegant, you know, singing. But I would like to point out to you, I'm talking about stuff like Though he may want you to 
things like this, you know. And John also is making something similar in his part. You can also simplify this and skip this one, you know. But if you want to recreate the exact record and train over singing this wonderful vocal harmony, you could pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, he after that he demonstrates it and it, he does a beautiful job. He one of those people that's really, you know, loyal to their to the what they do. So um, it's great because you have this guy breaking down the vocals of the Beatles and you have Mike Bocelli breaking down the guitar parts of the Beatles. It's really very kind of cool. So um, I want to comment on the ending, which is this boy. Da, 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 da. And that has to be a slide on the guitar. And that may be the very first mm. mo moment that George ever uses a slide. Yeah. Yeah, good catch. Yeah, but definitely. you can hear it clearly. That yeah. glissando yeah, yeah, yeah. cannot be fake, but um, uh, you, you can't, you can't, or, you know, um, I don't have a slide handy, do I? All right, yeah, but uh, yeah, it, 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 without question, it's a slide. So there's that. Um, the form of the song is very, very simple. It's intro, A, A, B, A, and out, coda. That's all. It's just an A, A, B, A, which we're noticing with these early songs, we're getting that form. You know, I forget, it slips my mind with the la with last single we did, but it also had an A, A, B, A, very simple form. Um... Now, another thing, uh, music aside, I think I've hit all the salient points about the music. Um, you know, they did the fade out, which was standard in those days, and probably even kind of cool. They probably thought it was really cool in those days to do a fade out. Um, but I want to talk about the lyric for a moment. All right. We have... Not getting specific into it, but, you know, this boy, this boy, da, 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 da. but this boy wants you back again. Then he proceeds into that boy and talks about that bastard, right? So we have the the balance between this boy and that boy. So the question comes up, and just merely like pop practicality, right? How does the listener know that the song is named this boy or is it that boy? Like, which is it? Well, first of all, the very first line we hear is this boy. So that's giving us a hint. Uh, but my belief uh, is... Wait, I think you got that backwards. <laughs> that boy took my love away. Does it start with that boy? I believe so. Yeah. Oh, my God. Wow. All yeah. right. Other way around. All right. You saved me, though. You saved me. Fact check, right? <laughs> so, fact check. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I, I wasn't even that I just tossed off as a thought, but the ending of the song, I think, was partially George Martin's idea for them to sing this. Boy, this boy, over and over again. So the listener would get it into their head. Knows That's what the, the name of the title song. is. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. You know. Yeah, and uh, people who've watched the anthology eight thousand seven hundred and twenty-two times, like us, will remember from the outtakes where Paul and John are flubbing it up, and this, that, this, that boy, and they can't—they're falling apart <laughs> laughing because they keep messing it up. Right, right, right. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, I remember that. In fact, uh, I I seem to vaguely recall like something with the ending where they're going this boy and then that boy, this boy, that boy at the ending. I I, I don't know if that's just a glitch in my memory or not. But, yeah, I don't remember that. But I do believe they 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 sing this boy over and over again at the end. They that's, do. Yeah, in the correct. final version. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah so. Um, I don't think there's much else to say about this. Like, I love the, the lead vocal. I love John. He's so sincere, and I, I just love that. It's just, it's it's a beautiful song. What, what is your feeling about the song? I mean, do, I've do you always like liked it? it. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful song. Yeah. It definitely has the kind of old-timey feel, as we talked about. There's yeah. kind of like the mm -hmm. 
after the Beatles sound and the before the Beatles sound. This is a before the Beatles yeah. sound. But they do it beautifully. The harmony is perfect. And when uh, when uh, the Beatles vocal harmony guy does that and shows you, you know, they're they're varying it a little. There's little things in there. You definitely hear that. You pick up on that, even if you're not yeah. focused on it. You mm -hmm. can definitely tell that they're they're doing little things to modify their voices. Anyway, it's very beautifully done. Um, I've always enjoyed it. I, and and for I, me, I absolutely, just... there's no doubt it is about that bridge, the emotional climax of the bridge. Oh. That's yeah, the heart of the song. Yeah, you can really feel the trajectory up into that. And, you know, once we get there, it's kind of like, wow, thank you for that. And now the song's going to ease us out yeah, again. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, yeah. but I've always seen the trajectory of Beatles songs kind of like a three quarter way climb to this height and then an easy drop back down, but a quicker one than the, than the climb mm. was, you know. Mm. Yeah, James, I have the feeling that you have a, a soft spot for the romantic ballad. I get that feeling because you like uh, "If I Fell." You're you're a big fan of "If I Fell." That's too, true. Right? I think it's actually the harmonies, because the it's thing the again the the thing that blows me away about "If I Fell" is that beautiful interplay with John and Paul's harmony. I love that. Oh wait, I'm not thinking of "If If I Fell." Oh no, I am thinking of "If I Fell." Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, again, this song is kind of akin to this one in the, in the really tight yeah. harmony yeah. part. Well, this one is three harmonies. parts, so even more impressive. I yeah. Suppose, but. Um, yeah, that's one thing I truly miss in music, uh, contemporary music, is vocal harmony. Mm -hmm. It can be so soulful and so, like, stirring almost. I remember know? growing up, you know, 20, 30 years ago, listening to music on the radio and... and I remember thinking at the time, like listening to the Beatles and then listening to what's on the radio. I'm like, well, how come no one does harmonies anymore? And then I'm like, oh, I don't think they can. <laughs> I don't think yeah, they know how. <laughs> yeah. And I have to say, like, um, aside from like the Motown kind of um, um, the doo kind of guys, the black groups from Motown, uh, those guys were doing harmonies and it was mostly call and responsey kind of stuff and the beatles definitely picked up on that but i will say this the stress on harmony that the beatles put there if you take a band like um crosby stills nash and young i don't think that band would have existed without the beatles because the beatles were the masters of tight harmony you know they and i think they inspired a lot of people well to be fair um, i mean they were the everly brothers right simon and garfunkel the, right. yeah 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 everly's well yeah was simon and garfunkel predate the beatles i think they did they were roughly the, the similar British times invasion. anyway right yeah. yeah 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 this is true there there was that but uh i don't know i think there's something about the beatles like there was something about like everything the Beatles did was cool. And every time people heard it, they said, oh, we got to do that because the Beatles did it. And it's so cool, you know. Um, so I think uh, they, they opened up the door to more of those vocal possibilities, you know. And I mean, think about a lot of their source material. They were covering a lot of like female singing groups and things like this. Oh, yeah. That, you yeah. Know, were, I, if you think about it, it's kind of a weird choice, right? But. It worked for them in their style, and it helped to develop their harm harmonic side, I think. Yeah, that's really true. And uh, yeah, absolutely, that's true. And it's, it's different when you look at the Everly Brothers or um, or other duet singers. There was also, uh, you never close your eyes anymore. I forget the name of that. those two guys. Uh, yeah, them. Them. <laughs> you know, it's a whole, whole and Oatsy kind of duet people, you know. Uh, the Beatles were three-part harmony a lot of the time, and they could do call and response because, you know, you could have the harmony in the background as the response to the main lead vocal call, uh, which, you know, again, that, 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 that comes all out of gospel music. I mean, credit where it really is due is American black music 100%, you know. I will never say otherwise, but I think, you know, because black music was was kind of frowned upon in those days by the white households and the beatles managed to make that black music cross over into white house households uh you know it became quotes acceptable they extended the elvis revolution as it were yeah 
Yeah. Uh, but man, fact you check, know, the Righteous Brothers. Righteous Brothers, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Who were great. I think uh, Hall and Oates were very inspired by those two. And I loved Hall and Oates, too. I thought they were fabulous. Well, but uh, yeah, since okay, we're talking so... about the harmonies of this, I will... Once again, I remember when we talked about... We were talking about this maybe in one of our lessons a few months ago. And I mentioned the um, Sean Lennon, Robert Schwartzman, Rufus Wainwright cover that they did of this song at Come Together, A Night for John Lennon's Words and Music in 2001 which is on YouTube. You can go watch it. Um, <laughs> and I remember saying, like, because I, I watched it years ago, and I'm like, yeah, I really like that performance. I thought it was good. They kind of captured the essence of the song. And then I rewatched it after saying that, and I'm like, this isn't actually as good as I remember. It's all right, but it's not great. But actually, the interesting thing was after rewatching it, I thought Rufus really added something nice to it. And I don't like Rufus Wainwright's voice. No haters. I just, it's not my style. But in that mix, it he... His weird style kind of worked for that. But uh, yeah, it's definitely, as I say, it's all about that climax in the middle. And at least Sean kind of nailed that. So I think if you nail that, you get the song. Yeah. Yeah, there are, are the Beatles song interpreters and there's a the Beatles song precise replicators. And of the two categories, I really, I hate to say this, but I prefer the people who play Beatles music note for note exactly as it is because... It's something for me, like, what song was I thinking of recently that that, oh, I was talking about how, I forget, oh man, it's terrible, I forget the name of the band that did this, they were on YouTube, but they did the entire Ram record by Paul McCartney live, note for note, and it gave me a whole different perspective on what this record really was, and how, like, it's mind-bogglingly great that record um so that's why i like that when i hear beatles in other contexts i get to appreciate it in a different way like oh other lines begin to come out that i never realized were there or, you know so yeah so hopefully you know in the future there will be like uh an upsurge an upswing of bands that that do three-part harmony vocals i'd love to hear that again it'd be beautiful we need more of that. Um, the whole. Sorry, I just have mm -hmm. one question about the chord progression. So in the Brit in, in the chorus, we're switching to G, momentarily. That's actually the bridge because the chorus is built into sorry, the verses. I meant the, yeah. The bridge. Yeah. Um, are you asking me? Is it in G at that point? Yeah. Like, is it committed to the key of G? Yeah. All right, well, the proof is in the pudding, so let me, like, um... Think the song could end there on the G chord? No. Absolutely not. No, no. it wants to come around. Yep. yep. The only, see, modulation, that's the difference between you. It's like a lot of things in music are like, there's this kind of like fuzzy, vague edge to a lot of things in music. And one of them is, is modulation. Is it really dedicated? Is it really in the key of G? No, it isn't, because we can hear there's more traveling to do before we get back to the root. So, you know, how would we make a G? to get back to D. Now it feels like we're modulating again because we have to go through that trouble of bringing in a chord to take us back to D. So you can hear the difference. Yep, yep, yep. And a lot of modulation is simply based on, or you could modulate based on the idea, I'm going to sit on this chord until the people's brains assume this is the new root, which is precisely what I did in that moment. I just stuck, I just stuck on that G chord and vamped on it. So finally it got locked in, you know. So no, it's it's not in G. It, it, if anything, I'd say if there's any modulationy thing going on there, it's closer to B harmonic minor. Um, yeah, I, you, yeah, I 
Right. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You, it could go there. Right. But of course, as soon as we go. Um... Get that D7. Now we're going elsewhere. Yeah. We're going somewhere else, baby. Yeah, you know, sure. yeah. trip isn't over. Yep. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, well, it it works beautifully. It's simple but very effective. It's yeah, it's a simple little beautiful pop song. And uh, do you know what's next in the Beatles singles coming up? Let's find out. I can't wait to get to uh, their middle period. I want to get into things like Day Tripper and stuff. Okay, so we have just covered I Want to Hold Your Hand, This Boy. Um, roll over, Beethoven. Please, Mr. Postman. Uh, please, Mr. Postman is a cover, and so is Roll Over Beethoven. Yeah. So Do not... we want to count those? Nah, that's maybe, but maybe not. Uh, the next would be I Want to what? Hold Your Hand. I saw her standing there. I think this is a mix of American and British singles. And <laughs> yeah, anyway. it sounds like it. Gives us more flexibility. Anyway, we'll, we'll decide this. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, Everyone when I leave your vote in the movie. comments, and then we'll decide whatever we decide. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> if there's a majority of, like, three, yeah. we'll, we'll go with that. If there's one person who responds, <laughs> we might consider you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Should we do roll over Beethoven or uh, please, Mister Postman, or should we move on to the next Beatles original? I feel we should song? move on because this isn't their composition. We could talk it's about their, their interpretation, comp- but I don't know. That doesn't seem I, like right. It's exactly the point. And you know, really, Mister Postman is a great little tune. There's no question, and it, it's be worthy of looking at. But uh, I think we're here to do the Beatles, so you know. Agreed. Let's do that. All right, so I want to give a big thumbs up to Galeazzo Frudua, and pardon me if I'm not Frudua, if I'm not pronouncing it uh, You're correctly. You're Italian. Come control. on, Vanny. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, uh, Mike, Pac- uh, Mike Pacelli for his Beatles guitar work, and also um, I don't know his first name. Lub. All you need is Lub. Uh, that channel for doing really great reproductions of Beatles songs. So, and that'll be it for the day. Tight hour. Tight hour, I tell you. <laughs> oh, I, I, I was fooled, you know, because mine says 32 minutes. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Tight hour. <laughs> Makes more sense. All right, cool. So, um, are we... We're still rolling. You can I... say goodbye if you want. Goodbye, Oh, uh, all right. Yeah, please. <laughs> I, I want to say goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Don't forget to vote. <laughs>